is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Flea Bag, season one, episode four. In this episode, Flea Bag and her sister go to a silent retreat, and I just don't really know why they do it. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Bert for commissioning this episode. What's up, Bert? So, um, yeah, I know that their father got it for them as a gift. And maybe that's all it takes is the fact that they were given the retreat and they were just like, well, it would be rude not to go. But honestly, giving somebody a gift of a silent retreat is rude in and of itself. And I don't feel like it would bother me to turn that shit down. I would take that personally. I just would. Um, this episode is a really weird one because of the setting and how condensed and and it it's not a bottle episode. You know, obviously those all take place like in the same room, but it feels so removed from the settings that we are used to seeing Fleabag in where there's like a sexual component. And dating is like a possibility. Meeting somebody new that she might be interested in is a possibility. And that's just not part of the scene for this episode. And so it really changes the dynamic of her versus the rest of the world when that is sort of removed from the equation. Um, so we start off with her and her sister in the car and she is trying to give her sister directions from her head without actually opening her phone and getting the directions out. And it's one of those where <laughs> this is something that I have encountered with various friends of mine that they like want to prove that they know the way and that they don't need a GPS. I don't understand what you're trying to prove. I just want to get where I need to go. I don't want to be late. I don't want to wind up in some weird fucking area. And I just, there's no reason. There's no reason. The principle of the thing is nothing. Just pull out your fucking phone. Oh my God. Um, and Fleabag is holding on to the handle inside the car, which makes her sister feel that she is judging her driving. Um, Remind me, guys, does her sister have a name? I forget if she's one of the, you know, characters that doesn't actually get one because some people don't. But I think she did. I keep thinking like Charlotte. I don't know. I don't remember. But um, they're driving and her sister is very tense. And... She makes a joke. Do you know what the lesbian app for Grinder is called? And there's a long pause. And then she says, twat nav. And her sister starts laughing and then starts crying and says, don't make this fun. And all of a sudden they are pulled over and her sister is insisting that she's fine. I know I seem mental, but I'm fine. I just sometimes need you not to take the piss. Do not finish my sentences. And what's kill like this scene is so great because she's like, you don't always know what I'm going to say. And, you know, we've seen that Fleabag is very into predicting what a person's going to say. Claire, thank you, Juliet. Claire, I knew it was a C. Um, we've seen that Fleabag is very into predicting what other people are going to do. This is partially just due to her, like, 
I think having a bit of a superiority complex in a weird way about knowing other people so well and how predictable they are. And also I think it's probably a coping mechanism because like when you are somebody who has not been treated well, you try and anticipate the way other people are going to behave in order to keep yourself from being harmed by it. You know, it can be sort of a trauma response. Um, So, yeah, we know that she likes to try and predict what her sister's going to do. And we've seen her be wrong about it. You know, in just the last episode, she gives her sister a birthday cake and says she's not going to eat it. And then her sister eats it immediately. And she's very surprised by it. Um, But yeah, she's crying. And it's this moment of like, obviously, there is something else going on. But she doesn't want to talk about it. And we don't really get an answer, like, really, until later on when she tells Fleabag that she got the promotion in Finland, I think it is, which would, first of all, make her a millionaire. I'm not sure that we know exactly what she does for work, but apparently bitch is doing all right. And that Martin doesn't want her to take it. <clears throat> which really that seems to be the crux of it is just that she has this thing that she really wants that she isn't being allowed to take. <clears throat> There's a lot of, you know what? I'm going to wait. I'm going to get to that. I was about to make this big comparison, but it's about a thing that happens later on in the episode and we'll get to it. And then I will circle back and we will do it. But I need to not get ahead of myself, which is something that I always tend to do. Now, this moment of her complete breakdown over kind of nothing is so deeply fucking relatable. I am like, I think all of us, especially those of us in the United States, where the pandemic has not been handled well. Our individual states are being absolute horror shows. The people that we are having to rub shoulders with, so to speak, do not take shit seriously and are willing to put other people at risk. We have been holed up for a year. A lot of us have done all we can to avoid being out in public. And it feels like others are not taking that shit seriously at all. So many of us are struggling a lot with mental health crises lately. It's been really beginning to stack up. And I have just seen, (laughs) I'm sure many of you have as well, an explosion of advertisements for mental health apps and online services. And one of the refrains that we see that that I hear from friends of mine is how they are all like on the edge of a panic attack all the time that it feels like I'm either about to like completely hyperventilate and freak out or burst into tears or scream at somebody and like get in a fucking fight. It's just like, you know, some expression of extreme unhinged emotion is going to happen And who knows what it's going to be that like sends me over the edge, but it's lurking and waiting and who knows. And it's really interesting that, um, her sister has this meltdown here and it's really easy to see her sister as the neurotic one because she is a lot more upfront about what a mess she is. She's a lot more, uh, she's a lot less likable in some ways than Fleabag is because she doesn't have the kind of flippant sense of humor and the glibness. But there is an honesty to it that I can appreciate. Whereas Fleabag, we hear her literally say later that she always wants to cry all the time. So she calls her sister a fucking psycho in this intro for breaking down in a way that we find out she also wants to break down and yet can't, won't, who knows. And, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing that, um, 
is it's you can see i think the purpose of characters like this is that you can see a bit of yourself in all of them and so some of us are occasionally claire where we do just completely like meltdown boom it's like out there we have all of our our restraints have dropped we have lost control and then sometimes we're flea bag where we can barely admit how badly we're doing to anybody like even ourselves and sometimes the easiest person to confess that to is a stranger or somebody that is practically a stranger and it's a shame how it's just a shame it just is you know emotions are so frustrating and I am not good at dealing with them personally. You know, I am, I am capable of great empathy and I can see from a intellectual perspective why people would be feeling a certain way, why I might be feeling a certain way in an abstract sense. But when it comes to actually coping with the way that I feel and learning how to deal with it head on, I am a child. I'm really, really bad at it. And it's something that I'm working a lot on. Um, just yesterday, um, some of you know that Owen and I have two cats. We have Aria and Ripley. Aria is the uh, mean sort of problem cat that Owen got before I moved in. And she is very sweet to me and to him. But with strangers, she gets bad anxiety and can be really mean and not like mean I am upset and I run and hide, but mean like I'm going to stand my ground and rip your face off. We got Ripley because she was a stray with no tail and had been chewed up. It was clear. Um, and we took her in and things seemed okay for several months. And then she went into heat and all of a sudden, Aria started to spray all over the house. And it has been years now of Aria spraying. This is part of why she's not allowed in my office. She's not allowed in Owen's office. We even keep the bathroom door closed so that she doesn't go in there and like pee on the towels and stuff. We have had to close off a lot of our home. And we've been trying to figure out what to do. And the other day, she peed on our new mattress and bed frame. The bed frame is an upholstered bed frame. And the mattress had like a waterproof cover on it, but the waterproof cover did not come down over the sides of the mattress. And of course, that was where she peed. It was not a cheap mattress. And we just got it like last September, I think. Devastating, honestly, like, it's going to be okay. I have this cleaner called Zero Odor. If you guys have problems with odor in your home, I can't recommend this shit enough. It's the only thing that's ever worked on Cappy. But nevertheless, it's very tiresome. And I kind of flipped out. I really did. When she peed on this mattress, I completely fucking lost my mind. And Owen and I have been discussing what to do because we don't want to just toss her outside and make her like an outdoor only cat. I don't think she'd survive. I don't want to rehome her and have people who are not prepared to deal with this suddenly find out that she sprays and maybe they'll throw her out. I don't want to, you know, I give her up to a pound or something that may put her down, but we don't really know what to do. And we were talking yesterday about our options and Owen suggested that maybe we send Ripley who seemed to trigger the spraying to his grandparents to stay for a few months and see if maybe Arya calmed down with her spraying behavior if Ripley was gone. And you guys, I couldn't stop crying all day yesterday. I just was either crying or had just stopped crying and was getting it together or was on the verge of starting to cry again. It was a very, very bad day. And it's the sort of thing that, like, I know that in a lot of ways he's right. My reaction emotionally is out of proportion to what he's suggesting. He's not saying that I have to get, give up my pet. He's saying we will send her to somebody and see what happens. 
And even if things do improve with Arya, Ripley living with his grandparents would still get to see her and they don't have any pets right now. And probably this would be great for his grandmother who just lost her dog last week. But you guys, when I tell you those waterworks started and they would not be shut off and I couldn't understand what was happening. And it was so, it was sort of scary in a way. And I, f I really felt Claire in this scene. It just was so close to how I was behaving yesterday with just this, like, somebody cracks a joke and you just have this moment of, like, it, it's like your wires get crossed. And the way that she says, don't make this fun, it's almost like she wants to be more okay with, like, she'd rather things be unhappy because at least she can deal with that like the the expressions of affection and joking are the, the, they're too close to her heart even though they are not sad it still pokes that same like nerve of making you feel at all and you just don't want to do that right now because you're too fragile and anything that touches that shell is going to shatter it, whether it's good or bad. And you just don't want anything. And I sort of get it, man. I really do. So I just, I don't know, especially after the day that I had yesterday where it was just constant tears. And I had spent like the previous night crying because of the mattress. It was, I just, this one hit for me a little bit too hard. Um, and Juliet says, you can see Fleabag and Claire's dad in the way they feel about and handle emotions, I think. It's interesting how repressed Fleabag is emotionally, despite being very sexually, quote, liberated. Yeah, for sure. And that's the thing about sexual liberation is that, you know, it's all well and good in principle, but you can use sex to distance yourself from people. And that's absolutely what she's doing. She's using it to distance herself from people and to distance herself from herself. It's part of like... Everybody has something that they use in this way. Some people, it's work. Um, I can be that way, but for me, it's mostly humor. Humor is how I pull myself out of things. It is how I give myself some breathing space. And it can be a deflection. Um, and yeah, like I have turned my humor into work. So now it's like a kind of a one two punch, you know, and I feel I think Claire for her, it's the work for sure. Um, but yeah, they both have their thing for sure. Juliet says, my therapist told me that stressed people deal with stress less well. And it's obvious, but also super helpful. Claire definitely demonstrates that. Oh, yeah. It's really, it's a shame what like a fetitiz fetitization fetitizes Fet I can never get that word right. We have fetishized stress, especially Americans. We really love to act like being constantly under pressure is some sort of weird like badge of honor. It, it makes us feel virtuous, you know, and it's like, it's just so foolish. It's so, it's so foolish and pointless and damaging and really... I think we're finally starting to see it in the past couple of years. And I think the pandemic has really thrown it into sharp relief. How pointless so much of our struggle has been because capitalism just won't let us win. Like we have told ourselves a story about how, yeah, I might be stressed now, but it's for a good cause. And eventually it will get me out of where I'm at. And, um, you know, maybe. I am lucky in that my work has helped get me out of a really bad place that I was for the past few years. And I am in a much more stable situation now. But that's very recent. I can't shake the feeling that it will go away at any time. And I am an exception because I own my own business and work for myself. I am not trying to hold me down the way that so many people's employers are. So anyway... Getting off that soapbox, as usual, 20 minutes into the recording, and I have not even gotten to the fucking cold open yet. Um, so they're walking to the building. And as a, uh, like, as we start this episode, we don't know where they're going. We're not aware of what's, you know. And Claire says, um, 
No. Fleabag says, Dad really splashed out this time. And Claire says, he must be about to do something awful. And Fleabag says, no, it's just Mother's Day. Oh, you guys. That really was, that was a mean one. This idea of like, sending your daughters away. Because it's Mother's Day. And you don't want to fucking deal. <sighs> you know? And I really wonder what he does with their godmother. Because, like, it's godmother slash stepmother. She feels like the kind of person that would want to be paid tribute on the day. But doesn't actually hold any of the responsibilities and so doesn't really deserve any of the accolades related to the day. But I don't know. And um, they're heading inside. And as they're walking in, uh, they mention that it's a silent retreat. And they get to the doors and they just hear some guy yell, sluts. And... I love the way <laughs> Fleabag just sort of turns and goes, hello? Like, I'm sorry, did you, did somebody call me? I could have sworn I heard somebody yell my name. <laughs> oh my God. I just found that so funny. Just the, the mildness of her reaction, I think. It's not like, what the fuck? It's more just like, oh, is somebody, what? I just found this really funny. And this winds up being a recurring thing that happens throughout this episode because there is a retreat for men next door. So what this is, it's so good, you guys. It's so good. It's so good. It's so good. <sighs> We've got a retreat for women. That is meant to be silent, where they clean in silence and do like menial labor in silence all day, while next door, the men have their own retreat with blow up dolls and rage training. It doesn't even feel like that. Basically, the guys next door are free to make as much noise as possible and be as degrading as possible all for the sake of their like improvement as people. And this is allegedly to assist them in dealing better with women on a personal level. Um, and it's just such a beautiful bit of metaphor you guys the women are over here expected to be absolutely silent and work all day and clean while next door we've got a bunch of men who are just screaming at the symbols of women in their lives not even actual women anything representing a woman and free to not only make as much noise as they want for their own sake but also impinge on the like psyches of the women very nearby as if that has no effect to just hear a group of men screaming slut over and over again while you're on a silent retreat. It's so perfect. It's just, that's just so perfect, honestly. <laughs> oh God. But we don't know that's what's happening here yet. So they get led inside and, um, the the whole intro is this this actress here um who plays the receptionist looks so familiar and i don't know if i know her from like doctor who or what but um they are are they're, they're, they sort of each want a different thing from this retreat fleabag wants to stay in a double with her sister and her sister wants a separate room but that's not how it goes. We share here. Uh, everything is part of the communal experience. There's no Wi-Fi. 
We don't get newspapers. We really try to keep the external world out. And I hope you have a restful weekend. And I love the fucking like prayer hands that she does when she says this. I just don't think so. I would not. I do not consent to this. I cannot imagine not only being silent for like an entire weekend, but also doing that around total strangers and this being intended to be restful. And then you add in menial tasks. I loved, I loved at one point when they're like scrubbing the floor and Claire is like, what even is this? I don't even do this in my own home. And I was literally thinking it right before she said it, it was just like, they're on their hands and knees, like fucking Cinderella scrubbing the floor with like bristle brushes. Who even has a bristle brush? Like what? And then she said that and I fucking cackled. Um, Karen says, also, a little Easter egg. The feminist lecture from episode one was called Women Speak, and the retreat is called Women Don't Speak. <laughs> oh, thank you, Karen. <laughs> oh, I did not put that together. God, this show is so good. Oh, God. Okay. That is really funny. <laughs> Oh, oh, God, this fucking hurts me. Um, and, oh, my God, the room that they're in, like, this house in general is so odd. And I really, like, this is one of those things that I feel just must be a different situation when you live in a country that has lots of old country estates. This isn't a thing that the U.S. has really, you know, like we have, um, we'll have like colonial homes or uh, like Victorian houses, but these sorts of estates are much rarer. The most, like the, the only thing that I can think of that aligns at all are like the homes in Rhode Island, like all of those huge, um, mansions. And those were built for the most part, I think around the turn of the century, they're like not that old. So this sort of thing is just not as common. If there were a retreat like this in the U S it would be like a giant, probably Victorian fucking farmhouse or something. But what it is here is like a manse that's been, you know, divided into rooms and whatnot. And it's just such an odd because like, when I imagine going on a retreat, I always think of a farm because of like the retreat that I went on in California. And I always imagine it in the context of like a commune and hippies and being like its own sort of ecosystem. And so this place being this very luxurious building is in direct contrast to what I expected. The rooms themselves and like, the furnishings are very sort of, uh, they're sparse. They're not done up in a way as to reflect the building that they are in. So I wound up realizing like, oh, okay, I'm seeing this through the lens of an American who's just like, oh, look at this fancy house. When I don't think that's how... Although I say that they were walking up to it and they were very impressed as they walked up to it. But regardless, I just was, I was really surprised at the whole like vibe of this place. Um, so at this point, uh, Claire notices first that there are like no electrical outlets in the room. Um, I'm assuming that there must be like some behind the furniture because there are lamps and things in here. But it's uh, obviously meant to discourage using technology, plugging your phone in, whatever. We also have the discovery of the tiny batteries. 
that indicate she was going to use them in her vibrator or perhaps was worried about running out of battery in her vibrator. And Fleabag really like pushes her. You didn't have to ask for a separate room. If you want to have a wank, I can give you some space. If you want to take 10 minutes, I'll just go into the bathroom and moisturize my wrists for a bit because she's been talking about the various things. She's got like a uh, moisturizer for her face, moisturizer for her for her uh, wrists and elbows and knees, uh, under eye stuff for the ends of her hair. This is one of those bits that it's like, I really do understand how absurd it is. But also all that shit is specifically formulated for different parts of your body and necessary if you want to care for those parts of your body. Look, I'm not mad about it. It's stupid. Yes, that we need to care about how our knees and elbows look. Granted, we should not as a race be so fucking preoccupied with that. That said, if you do care, you can't use the moisturizer that you use on your face, on your elbows. I mean, you can, but it's not going to be effective. It's not going to do anything. So anyway, I'm just saying that I relate to Claire a lot. Over and over again, I relate to Claire. It's uncomfortable. So uh, we have the first uh, flashback moment where and this was a really, there, there were a couple of them this episode, and one of them was really different from the others. First of all, we've got her opening up or, or pulling a vibrator out, and she's sitting on the bed with Boo, and Boo finds some batteries, um, and it turns out that they are from their alarm clock. And as she's like, popping the batteries into the vibrator there's a voice that says let go of your past and we see her sitting on the floor um and it's the woman who's like leading the retreat saying that and she looks at the camera and says bit on the nose and this lady continues now is the time to let go open up your senses close your mouth and live now Welcome to the female-only Breath of Silence retreat. Women don't speak. And this dude sits up and says, um, sorry, I think I'm meant to be at, um, and outside somebody yells, fucking sluts. And he goes sprinting out and says, that one. Hmm. Sir, looking around at this room full of women, you didn't realize that you were at the wrong one? It's fine. So she says, the first major consideration is, why are you here? And Fleabag, of course, comes out with this like completely generic response that very much pleases this woman. I want to uh, shut the noise out, reconnect to my inner thoughts on the road to feeling more at one with myself. All right. Yeah, sure. So then we get this odd moment. This weekend is about being mindful. It's also about leaving your voice in your head and trapping your thoughts in your skull. Think of it as a thought prison in your mind. That doesn't sound good. Oh my God. That just doesn't sound like a thing that is... Why would a thought pr trapping them? This is all not good. Uh, principal rules are no talking. If you need to communicate with any of our superiors, you can write on that board. Under no circumstances must you communicate even with each other. And th there is this moment where she says, no matter what happens, a word must not be heard. And she says something later about tension. Oh, it's not in this moment. It's later. Bah, damn it. Okay. Because I wanted to like pause and analyze it, but it won't be for a little bit here. So we see, oh my God, you guys. She's on her hands and knees in the garden with a pair of scissors 
literally trimming the grass around the like cobblestones. What is she, what is this? Really? Meanwhile, one of the women who is uh, raking on the other side of the is it? I don't think it's it's Claire. I don't think so. Is it? I can't tell from here. No, I don't think so. But she winds up, uh, I think, getting into like a wasp nest. And she can't like yell about it. And I just really felt for her in that moment. So this is the point at which Fleabag hears another man yell slag. And she's like, I can't resist. What is this? So she starts walking over to the other side. I don't know if it's like the same building or if it's a different. It looks like it's maybe like the same series of buildings. Um, And this guy is yelling, bitch, you fucking bitch. And she comes across this like room full of men all standing across from some blow up dolls dressed in various types of clothing. I would be so interested to know if, if they were instructed to like bring the clothing of a woman that they per- are particularly offended by. <laughs> um, it's called the better man weekend workshop. <laughs> and basically this is a moment for these men to learn what the not correct way to interact with women is. So they're given an example by the man leading this workshop. Uh, whatever the feeling that you have that is that is at the root of this, your experiences with women, your upbringing, it's time to reprogram. So this is Patricia. She's a friend. She got promoted past six other people. She's worked very hard for this. What is something that you do not want to say? And I think one of them says something like, uh, like clever munchkin, something that's very like patronizing, like she's a child, you know, um, a clever little munchkin. Yep. There it is. Who'd you blow to get that job? One guy says, and then the okay uh, is followed immediately by you fucking stupid slut. Well, all right, then. It's just amazing to think that this is necessary. But honestly, I kind of think it is. And that's so depressing. What should we say to her? And everybody is drawing like this blank until one man says, well done, Patricia. And Fleabag recognizes him as the man who yelled slut at her because she accidentally flashed him when she was applying for a loan in the first episode. And he doesn't quite recognize her right away. It's later on that they wind up reconnecting. But what a weird moment. I never thought that was going to come up again. And I kind of love it. So this one guy comes running out. Oh my God, um, miss, you can't be here. You really can't be here. It's for your own good. <sighs> yeah, girl, run, girl, run. So <laughs> this is, I think, the scene where these women are, they are paired up. Uh, Fleabag and her sister are meant to be like stretching and mirroring one another's movements. Look each other in the eye and touch. And she does this and her sister barely can keep her hands in one place before shivering, literally, and going, oh. And when they are upstairs alone in their bedroom again, she asks, are you okay? Really, are you? I really love, and I said this last episode, their relationship. I just am constantly surprised at how tender and 
loving they can clearly be with one another, despite the fact that they don't have any real connection that or not not that they don't have a real connection because they they do but they aren't making the kind of effort towards communication that i would associate with being close does that make sense it's all unsaid it's all subtext it's all the ways that they like look at one another the ways they commiserate at the same time over somebody saying something truly absurd that nobody else in the room seems per like perplexed by or even willing to comment on. Um, I just, I, I just really love the two of them. And at this point, Fleabag has pulled open the, uh, or she pulls down her comforter and shows that she has the vibrator out. And her sister is just like very irritated and puts it on her nightstand and is like, you know, though, it really was a pretty thoughtful present, actually, though, I have to admit. And then she says, and Martin getting me that sculpture, he must have really been over backward to get something like that. I feel very lucky. And at this point, Fleabag sits up and tells her the truth about where it came from. And her sister doesn't respond, just shuts the light off and tells her to go to sleep. And it's the beginning of the like couple of revelations that occur regarding her husband, this episode. Um, it cuts to the morning and this is the scene. This is the one. They're sitting on the floor. And this woman is uh, talking about delving into your past. Think of something you can't let go of. A moment of noise. Which is a good way of saying that, actually. A moment of tension. And it cuts to... A scene of, I think, Boo on her, like, it looks like she's, like, laying on the floor next to the bed. It looks like she's on the floor, whatever it is. And Fleabag hurriedly undoing her belt. And it looks like Fleabag had a glass in her hand, like she was holding, like, a wine glass at the same time as she's undoing her belt. And, yeah, definitely is. And it cuts right back to her in the present. And she kind of does this like, and looks at the camera and says, not for now. And I'm like, what the fuck was that? Because for a second, I was like, oh, is this the moment when Boo died? And then I'm like, no, she's not on the street. I'm assuming that Boo died on the street, you know, that she didn't like get a chance to wander home. And even if she did, why is she undoing her belt? This is like, it doesn't feel sexual. It doesn't feel like that because Boo doesn't seem to be moving. It feels like she came home and found her slumped and, and is trying to like do something. I don't know. There's just something very urgent and upsetting about this moment. And it's a total mystery. I really, I can't figure it out. I've been thinking about it. I can't figure it out. Um, and then she's told to think about a moment when she was more peaceful and she asks Boo, if you could change anything about the world, what would it be? And Boo says, my thighs. And I just, oh, it's such a shame how much I relate to that. But honestly, and she says, I've always been insecure about my face. And Boo says, I know you have been, but you shouldn't. There's nothing wrong with your nose. Ah, oh, this moment. And the way that she just starts laughing as she realizes. And she says, I always say the wrong thing. And this is, uh, 
another moment of it feeling like the two of them are romantically involved because they're in bed together, but they're both dressed. I have a feeling that maybe there was like a quality of being in love and they, it, it was just completely unconsummated. Um, and I say that it's a shame because like, it doesn't have to be that way. I don't want to always be like, well, it must have been romantic. They could just be incredibly close, dear friends. And that's absolutely just as valid. But there is an intimacy to the relationship that feels different than what most people have with a platonic friend. Um, so <laughs> then, we <laughs> then we cut to the next day. They are having lunch and um, Fleabag burns her tongue on the soup and kind of exclaims over it. They have the uh, polish the floors um, and Claire saying, I don't even do this in my own home. And <laughs> Fleabag says, oh, it's very simple. We paid them to let us clean their house in silence. And Claire just bursts out laughing and again it's that laugh that transitions into a cry guys i just i keep relating to her so much i had this happen with owen one time um it was years ago it was like probably when i had first moved down here and the divorce was just fresh my father's death was fresh the complete change of my life and everything that had you know been my life was gone and we were joking around and he said something really funny. I started laughing and I couldn't stop laughing. And then all of a sudden I was sobbing, crying. And it was just this like, I it was like a runaway train and I could not get a hold of it again. And just this moment of her bursting out laughing and then transitioning immediately into crying. <sighs> Girl, yep. Um... So this is when they get a talking to from the headmistress. You, uh, your fragrant lack of disrespect, flagrant, I, I said fragrant, your fragrant lack of disrespect smells amazing. Um, I suggest you try sitting here in silence. It will be beneficial to you. So this woman leaves. I'm surprised that there's nobody like left to sort of oversee the fact that they stay in silence because they immediately start talking. It's not even a question. And Fleabag finally looks at her and is the one to, again, instigate things. I went through your bag. I couldn't find anything. So you're just going to have to tell me what's going on with you. And finally, Claire admits that she got the promotion. Um, that it would have meant she would be a millionaire and that she's turning it down. <sighs> I love when she says, I'm turning it down. Fleabag says, what? Why? Looks at the camera and says, Martin, and then looks back at her sister. Martin says it would be unfair on Jake. Jake's her stepson. He's really weird, probably clinically, but nobody really talks about that. He freaks out if she's gone for longer than a day. And he's got this thing about trying to get in the bath with her. And then we see this scene of her in the bathtub and this young boy in his undies climbing into the tub. He's 15. <sighs> okay. Okay. I'm not going to get into it, but there is something so fucking cruel about knowing that somebody has a clinical issue and nobody wants to acknowledge it. And there, I have something going on in my family that is like along the lines of this, and I am not in control of the situation or in any position to do anything about it. But this person is obviously disabled and has been from birth and nobody has acknowledged it. And I don't understand what people are afraid of because all that will happen if you get somebody diagnosed is that you will now know 
how to handle the, the, like what's going on with this person better, perhaps have access to resources you didn't before. And generally you will be in a better place to help them. And I get so angry at people just not because of what shame, like get over it. Oh, I'm disgusted. So anyway, Fleming says, what are you doing? Go. This is what you've always wanted. And Claire says, I know, I know. <sighs> I have responsibilities. And she says, my husband isn't other people. My husband is my life. And Fleabag just blurts out, your husband tried to kiss me on your birthday. <sighs> you guys, I am so glad she told her. I genuinely am, especially in this moment when she's about to give up on her dream for a man who clearly could give a fuck. But Jesus, this is really rough. You know, it's really hard to watch. And and there's something so extra gross about Martin putting it on her, the thing that's going on with his son. It really feels like he has attached himself to Claire because she's there in a way that maybe Martin hasn't been or isn't interested in being. And he is expecting her to like sacrifice everything in order to make things easier on himself. That's the, that's really what it sounds like for me. And I am really glad that, that Fleabag told her, but you know, like, what do you do with this information at this point? I re Ugh. this is so awful. And she repeats again, did he? And Fleabag looks at her and just nods and is obviously like being totally honest. She gets up and leaves and she doesn't see her for most of the rest of the day. And this is when we have the, the heart to heart with the men who are gathered around the um, fire pit screaming slut. And she winds up encountering that banker again, who comes and sits with her. I really loved this scene. And he, he says that they want us to tell them what we want to get out of this. I don't want to tell them. They don't know me. Like, and this really hit for me. I... I have told you guys about how I went on the retreat in California when I was younger. And part of the whole thing was meant to be like honesty and telling people about what you'd gone through in your life, what it was that you wanted from life. And I just didn't have any interest in sharing that sort of thing with total strangers, whether or not their intentions were good was irrelevant. It was just, I don't like, it, it, that's not the point. I just, I can't even verbalize it exactly. Um, and he says, I want to move back home. I want to hug my wife. I want to protect my children, protect my daughter. I want to move on. I want to take clean glasses out of the dishwasher and put them in the cabinet and then watch my wife drink out of them. I want to apologize to everyone. I want to go to the theater, this whole thing. And it's clear as he's saying all of this, that Fleabag is really moved by it. Like there's something about all of this that's hitting her in a way that none of the shit over this weekend has worked. Uh, it's, it just hasn't connected, you know? And finally, he says to her, what do you want? And she says, I just want to cry all the time. And it's really funny in a way how we know that, right? As the audience, we have seen the grief she's dealing with and how completely she has managed to sidestep it every step of the way. And yet the like banner image for this show is her walking down the street with tears pouring down her face and her mascara is running all down her face. But 
it's like, you know, clearly not what's actually going on with her right now. So, and, and the, the question that I think a lot of us have when we're dealing with emotions like this is what if I can't stop? And I know that's my problem. When you feel this kind of grief, you're afraid to break the seal because you can't put that back on again. So what happens if you break it and now you're just broken? What if, you know, who knows? And she goes back to her room and her sister is already asleep in bed. It's dark by this point, and we don't really know what she's been up to. I don't know if she's been with this guy this whole time, if she was like doing up, but it feels like she's sneaking in. She gets into bed and she lays there for a second. And then all of a sudden she sort of thinks better of it and gets up, climbs into bed with her sister and spoons her in bed. In this really sweet scene where it, you're not sure if her sister is going to accept it for a moment. And then she reaches down and like grabs Bang's hand and pulls it up around her so that they're like hugging. And it's so sweet. But then when she wakes up in the morning, her sister's gone. And it's awful because like you see her look at the camera in the moment that her sister pulls up her hand. And there's a sort of uh, expression on her face like, oh, see, it's fine. We're fine. But then when she wakes up and her sister's gone. It's, no, we're not fine. It's not that simple. I don't get to just crawl into bed with her and be back to normal. That's not how this works. And she goes downstairs and asks if anybody has seen her sister. And when she runs into the main room, there is a chalkboard there that says, I left some money at reception. I've gone home. Just needed a bit of quiet. And it's just awful. I just really feel for her. I guess she's going to get a cab home. <sighs> she reaches into this, uh, into her like leggings and pulls out a phone that she has hidden there and calls Boo. And listens to the voice message. I can't come to the phone right now. Please leave me a message yaho or messaggio or whatever. And I'll get back to you. And then she looks at the camera and says someone should probably disconnect that. And that is the end of the episode. And it was pretty brutal. It really was. This is... The voicemail thing, I, um, duh, this was one of the worst things. When my father died, my father died in 2014, May of 2014, I think. Was it? Or 2013. And my grandmother died only about a month and a half later. And my mom, my dad, and my grandmother were my family. Like, I have a huge family on my father's side, but I was not connected to them very closely. I didn't see them at holidays. It was those three. And two of them died within months of each other. And it was devastating. And um, I had voicemails from both of them wishing me happy birthday. And one of them, my grandmother was singing. Um, the other one, my dad was just like cracking a couple jokes. And I held on to these voicemails really like listen to them on my next birthday and they were feeling pretty precious. And then, um, I woke up one day and they were gone and it turned out that like Verizon just deletes voicemails if they are past a certain date and past the like couple of year mark, evidently they just automatically get deleted and I completely lost it. Um, it was like they died again. It was a weird like moment, you know, of just this was it. This was what I had. And you took it. And why? Like for what? For nothing. And I got in touch with them. 
and tried to figure out if there was a way to get it back and there just wasn't. But if I still had them, I would listen to them all the time. I definitely would. You know, it's just you, the the sound of somebody's voice is something that there's no replacing that. And the fact that she did this here, it just feels like something that she does for comfort anytime something gets particularly bad. I really wonder what her sister's going to do because the fact that her sister embraces her in bed makes me feel like she knows better than to blame Fleabag. She's not doing that. Uh, people do. You know, people will blame the person who was harassed because it's easier than to blame the person who did the harassing because then you have to confront what that means about that person. And so I wasn't totally sure. I hoped that she wouldn't, but I wasn't sure. And I was very glad to see that she gives her a clear signal before bailing that I don't blame you. I'm not mad at you. Nevertheless, I really want to know what happens after that. Like, you know, so that is the end of the episode. Um, the next one I will cover will be a week from today, the 23rd of March. So guys, thank you all again for uh, hanging out with me and listening. I hope you've been enjoying it. Thank you again to Bert for commissioning this and I will be seeing you all again soon with a new episode until then toodaloo motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.